In 1991, a high school girl vanished after attending a party. Her abandoned vehicle was found in a school parking lot near her home. The prime suspect had not one, but two alibi witnesses for the night she disappeared. A solid alibi can often overcome much circumstantial evidence. But forensic evidence is another matter. On a Saturday night in November of 1991, 17-year-old Crystal Fate Todd was dropped off in a mall parking lot after attending a party. Since Crystal didn't have to be home for another hour, she said she was going to get something to eat before heading home. It was the last time Crystal was seen alive. When she wasn't home by 1 a.m., her mother contacted police. Corey County Police, may I help you? She also called Crystal's best friend, Ken Register, who said he hadn't seen Crystal all night. After I talked to Ken Register, I called one of my friends, and he got up out of bed and come in. And we went all over Conway hunting her, see if we could find her car anywhere. They found her car the next morning in a nearby school parking lot. Her purse and coat were inside. I don't know why I, mean, I had the feeling. It just something come over me that somebody had Crystal. 17-year-old Crystal Faye Todd was a senior in high school living in the small tobacco farming town of Conway, South Carolina. I was 39 when she was born. She was a miracle to me. And I just couldn't believe I had her. I was, proud, I was proud of her, too. Crystal's dad died when she was very young. But she grew up as a happy child, active in her church, sung in the youth group choir, and dreamt of going to college. She was very lively, good personality, good humor, very outgoing. Just loved to be with her friends, hanging out, and having a good time. Just a few hours after Crystal's abandoned car was found in a school parking lot, two hunters in a remote field noticed a trail of blood. It led to a nearby ditch. There lay a woman's body with multiple stab wounds and partially disrobed. It was brutal, and it was, uh, it, it's a scene that uh, will be with me for a long time. It was sexual in nature. Um, I mean, it wasn't a murder just to murder someone. There was sexual gratification. On the victim's finger was a high school ring. Engraved on the inside was the name Crystal Todd. I just wish it could have been me instead of her. I'd lived a long time. She hadn't lived no time. Investigators thought the perpetrator might have been from outside the area, but forensic evidence at the crime scene pointed much closer to home. Well, I don't really have a life anymore. I just exist. I go from one day to the next, and I don't even want to get up out of bed and face another day. It's just horrible, it don't get any better. Residents of Conway, South Carolina were appalled by Crystal Fate Todd's senseless murder. Medical examiner, Dr. Jamie Downs, performed the autopsy. She did have the defense injury to the left hand because we thought that odd at the time. Why would someone have 
defending himself with their left hand. She was right-handed. Why not use her right hand or dominant hand? The answer was discovered soon enough. One of the stab wounds penetrated the left side of her skull, which would have immediately paralyzed her right side. What does a defense wound tell you? It tells you the victim was conscious. It tells you the victim was not bound. It tells you the victim was cognizant of danger. Some of the wounds didn't cause bleeding, an indication they were made after death. The victim is completely dead. The victim is, is no longer struggling, yet the offender still had enough anger that he incised or cut the body after death. In all, she was stabbed 31 times. The term that we use is overkill. Uh, that's more wounding that is necessary to take someone's life. When Dr. Downs measured the wounds, he concluded that the murder weapon was a three and a half inch knife, the type with a blade that locks in place. It would have had to be a locking blade or it couldn't have penetrated the skull. Forensic evidence confirmed she had been sexually assaulted and that she was murdered on one side of the road and the body dumped on the other. Well, what it told me is that he was panicking and he simply wanted to disassociate himself from the crime. It told me that uh, he probably had never killed before and he was inexperienced in this type of uh, crime. In search for suspects, investigators first looked through Crystal's personal papers. On one of Crystal's school notebooks was the name Andy Tyndall, written on the cover. Friends say Crystal met Tyndall through a mutual acquaintance. Tyndall was a 31-year-old convicted thief wanted in Alabama for a parole violation. Police also discovered that he had a taste for high school girls. No doubt about it, we thought we had our man. He fit what we were looking for. Forensic scientists evaluated the rape test kit from Crystal's autopsy and discovered that the killer had type O blood with an extremely rare blood subtype characterized by the enzyme PGM. It stands for phosphoglucomutase. That is an enzyme that is stable in um, body fluids from, from individuals. The blood type, the secretor status, and the PGM subtype made him approximately 2% of the population. And the DNA profile of the perpetrator was highly unusual as well. We found that the profile was in fact rare and occurred with a frequency of approximately 1 in 250 million Caucasians and 1 in 1.5 billion blacks. Surprisingly, this forensic information exonerated their prime suspect, Andy Tyndall. More than 1,000 people attended Crystal Faye Todd's funeral. Crystal's best friend served as her pallbearers. Her grieving mother and police appealed to the community for any information about the crime. In response, a resident of Conway came forward to say he had driven by the school parking lot on the night Crystal disappeared and saw Crystal's car with a man and a woman standing beside it. Now police had another lead. A police sketch of his description looked to many like Crystal's mother, Bonnie, and her boyfriend. There's no question in my mind as I sit here today that the individual in that sketch was Bonnie Faye Todd's boyfriend. Police wondered just how much Crystal's mother knew about the murder. A witness told police that on the night Crystal disappeared, he had seen two people standing near Crystal's car in the parking lot. His description matched Crystal's mother and her mother's boyfriend. But when questioned further, the witness admitted he had been drinking that night and may have seen Crystal's mother on Sunday morning when she and her boyfriend found Crystal's car. 
I thought it was awful. Just as much as I love my daughter to even try to blame it on me. With Bonnie no longer a suspect, and their previous suspect, Andy Tyndall, exonerated by DNA testing, investigators had no other leads. So police commissioned a behavioral profile of the killer. Well, criminal behavior profiling is when you have an unsolved case and you study the crime and the behavior of the offender during the commission of the crime and you arrive at characteristics, it's a subjective opinion, you arrive at characteristics and traits of the unidentified offender, such as age, race, marital status, arrest history, educational level, things of that nature. The profile suggested that Crystal's killer was a white male in his early 20s and was a friend of Crystal's who lived within three miles of her home. The young man was angry and probably had a police record. He was physically strong. Above all, the profile suggested that he was confident he would never be considered a suspect. Since the profile suggested that the killer was one of Crystal's friends, police asked her male classmates and acquaintances to voluntarily give blood samples for DNA testing. Despite the challenge to their civil liberties, 52 men complied. It wasn't, well, anything's voluntary, but they still had a pool of names that they were pulling from. And, you know, and then when they pulled the name, then they would ask if you would go down and, and give the DNA test or give the specimen. And uh, everybody volunteered. It was, I haven't heard of anybody not doing it. Incredibly, one of those DNA profiles matched the DNA of the perpetrator, donor number 44. When investigators asked Crystal's mother to name the one person she would least expect to hurt her daughter, she identified the same man. He says, who do you trust her with day or night, anytime, anywhere that she won't date? And I said, Ken Register. Ken Register and Crystal Todd had known each other since childhood. Their relationship wasn't romantic, they were simply very good friends. They spoke together almost every day. And it was Ken whom Mrs. Todd first called for help on the night Crystal disappeared. Ken had also been one of Crystal's pallbearers. When police checked Ken Register's background, they discovered two troubling pieces of information. First, he had an explosive temper, and he also had a criminal record. Two months earlier, two local college students accused Register of exposing himself when he stopped to ask for directions. I'm lost. I'm looking for the library. Can you help me out here? Ew, ew. Ew. Three years before that, as a 15-year-old, Register was caught making obscene telephone calls to this woman, in which he described in detail how he wanted to assault and murder her. He said he would slip me wide open and uh, many other graphic descriptions. The murder Register described in these calls was identical to the murder of Crystal Fay Todd. Exactly where were you the night that Crystal died? But Ken Register was flabbergasted when told his blood DNA matched Crystal's killer. He asked police rhetorically why he would have agreed to a blood test if he was the killer. When police searched Register's car, they could find no evidence linking him to the crime scene. Register also had an alibi. His girlfriend said he was with her at this go-kart track that night, and his mother said Ken was home by 12.30. That alibi was about as strong as you're gonna get. Uh, very surprising to me. And it's always compelling evidence. I know where I was at, when I was at there that night, right here at my house, and I know when he came home. 
Although Ken Register's mother was his alibi witness, she would later play a key role in solving Crystal Todd's murder. Crystal Todd's best friend, Ken Register, was now the prime suspect in her murder. His DNA matched the DNA found at the crime scene, but he insisted he was innocent and provided two alibi witnesses, his girlfriend and his mother. Ken had been a regular guest in Crystal's home, but Mrs. Todd said she knew nothing about his criminal past. If I'd have known about the indecent exposure and the threatening phone calls, Ken Rich would never put his foot in my house. But I didn't find out about it until it was too late. And Mrs. Todd now reveals something her daughter told her, which may hint at the motive. In a week and a half before she was killed, she says, Mama Ken still wanting me to date him. I said, well, he must think of Lord Evie and him with a girlfriend. Yeah, she said, that's all he wanted was sex. And I said, well, don't go with him then. OK, Ken, let's go over this again. During police questioning, Ken Register denied any involvement in the murder. But towards the end of a six-hour interrogation, police told him his mother had sent him a message. Thank you. Ken, this is a note from your mother. Your mother says to tell us exactly what happened and to be truthful about it. And if you do, your mother says everything will be okay. And with that, Ken Register confessed. I did it. He said he saw Crystal around midnight at a traffic light near the school parking lot. Hey, Crystal. Hey, hey, what's up? Hey. How are you? Hey, listen, you want to go hang out or do something for a little bit? Yeah, cool. All, All right. right. Um, wait, just let me go park. All right, I'll follow you. Okay. All Crystal right. got into his car. They drove to a deserted location where a register said the two had consensual sex. The forensic evidence suggests it wasn't consensual at all. What, no condom? Are you stupid? Oh my god. Look, Ken, I'm telling you right now, if I get pregnant, I'm telling everybody you raped me. Don't blow it off. I'm serious. Asshole. When she got out of the car to get dressed, Register said he grabbed the hunting knife from the car and killed her. Further sexual activity took place after death. I don't think Crystal Faye Todd did anything that night to cause her death, other than the mere fact she got in the car with him. Prosecutors believe that Register cleaned his car sometime after the crime to remove possible evidence. The evidence was had been systematically destroyed before we realized that he was a suspect. In Register's home, police found an empty box, a box for a knife with a locking blade. Forensic scientists determined that the missing knife would have been similar to the weapon used to inflict Crystal's stab wounds. Before the trial, Register recanted his confession, saying it was coerced. He said police lied to him about the contents of his mother's note. But lying to a suspect during a police interrogation is perfectly legal. There's no doubt in my mind that Mr. Register brutally and viciously killed Crystal Faye Todd. And there's also no doubt in my mind that he enjoyed doing it. I mean, there was just too much time unaccounted for. He had plenty, ample time, to do everything that he was accused of and still be home when he said he got home. But why did Register willingly give a blood sample for DNA testing if he was the perpetrator? Published reports say 
that when police requested a DNA sample, Ken Register asked, what is DNA? At the time, DNA testing had been used in criminal cases for about five years, but Register was apparently unfamiliar with it since it hadn't yet been used in the state of South Carolina. His case was the first. Ken Register was convicted of murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. He was sentenced to life in prison, plus 35 years. They found him guilty. I was glad they found him guilty now. I was proud of that. But I won't even get let rich here. Mental job, psycho. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong, but something's not clicking to where you're supposed to be clicking. Ken Register and his family still say he is innocent, but several subsequent DNA tests have all confirmed the original findings. I know what I know because I know I was home that night, and I know when he came home. I can't explain the DNA. I wished I could. There's, there's so many questions in this that you can't explain. Based on everything that I know about the violence of this crime, and is that, is that when he left the scene of that murder, he would have been a bloody mess. I think there's a lot of covering up going on in that house. She's seen him covered in blood all over, and I know he was covered in blood all over. He had to be. And if, if she helped clean him up, she got crystal blood on her hands, too. Bonnie Faye Todd visits Crystal's grave faithfully, and she thanks science for bringing Crystal's killer to justice. I love you more than I do in my own life. Without the DNA and the blood, we would have never gotten to first base, probably never even made an arrest. That's scary. Yeah. 